Welcome to part two of the January 2013 edition of the Science Center Storm Center's monthly threat update. In this part, we'll talk about securing OS 10 mountain line. And here are the basic options we'll go over. We first go over the install of mountain line on a new system. Then we'll go over system preferences. A little bit about Safari, what the options are here, then uh, the benefits of guest accounts. Also want to talk there a little bit about uh, different account uh, types that you have in OS 10, and uh, finally additional software that you may want to consider in addition to what comes with OS 10 Mountain Line. Now what you see here is the first reboot after we installed the initial system. That's also pretty much what you get from a new Mac that you just purchased. Of course, initially you have to set up your localization, where you are and what keyboard you're using. We do assume that we are using a fresh install, so we're not going to use any old information. The first kind of security and privacy setting uh, that uh, comes up is location services. Now, uh, this has really a couple aspects to it and it's not as easy as just turning it off. If you turn it off, uh, then you also lose access to some services that you may like on mobile systems, like uh, for example, Find My Mac. Uh, the location on laptops is determined using Wi-Fi uh, networks. So whether or not you enable that uh, really up to you, uh, there are pluses and minuses, of course. We are not going to set up a uh, iCloud account here. The iCloud uh, integration is something we'll talk about a little bit uh, more later. Has advantages uh, like remote manageability, but also disadvantages that now the security of your system depends on the security of uh, this iCloud account. So here we're just uh, going to skip uh, setting up an iCloud account. And then of course, we are just going to agree uh, to uh, the uh, license terms. And after that is done, uh, the first sort of a really important decision comes up and that's what's the first account we are uh, going to set up on this system. Now, you kind of have two options. Uh, you can set up an administrator account that's only used to administrate the system or you can set up a normal user account that's also an administrator. The commonly recommended uh, setup is to have two accounts, an administrator and a normal account, but the normal account is not an administrator of the system. This uh, you're probably used to from the Windows world. In OS 10, this is not really all that important. However, it still helps with uh, sort of some you know, separation of duties. Uh, it is recommended uh, very much if this is a shared system. So in this case, we are going to just set up a specific administrator account. And of course, we are going to pick a strong password for this account. There are two additional options uh, we have highlighted here. First, uh, require a password when logging in. If this is not checked, then the account you're just setting up is logged in automatically. So we definitely want this checked and it's checked uh, by default. We may also set up a password hint. I don't like password hints and uh, so I usually just enter no hint uh, to uh, just have something in this uh, field. One uh, dialog you see created out here and that's allow my Apple ID to reset this user's password. This is created out because we didn't set up an Apple ID. If we would have set up an Apple ID and we check this checkbox, then uh, the Apple ID can be used essentially to administer uh, this system and it has administrator functionality. If you do so, then as I said before, the security of this system will depend on the security of your Apple ID. Finally, we get to pick our time zone and uh, to register our system. Uh, we'll just uh, skip over this here quickly as it's not really security relevant. We're not registering here because this is just a little throwaway system I'm setting up for this demo. So well, this is the initial setup, uh, but 
uh, because we installed from an install medium or even if you purchased uh, this machine in a store it's probably not up to date so always the first thing you should do is you should run software update in mountain lion software update happens uh, via the app store so it will uh, check for updates now and uh, then you can install them if there are any updates available here we do have a one update available so uh, let's just click here and install this so now our update finished uh, let me close uh, the app store and at this point we are now ready to move on and uh, check our system preferences now let's start with a security and privacy of course here this uh, particular item has uh, four different uh, tabs here now you may notice that uh, some of them are grayed out in order to activate them we first have to authenticate as administrator here the top we can change our password now where it gets interesting from uh, our security policy point of view is whether or not we require a password once the screensaver starts that's of course overall a good idea you can set a little bit of delay in requiring a password i kind of like the five second delay that way if uh, the screensaver comes on for example you're on a conference call and uh, just have a document in front of you that you're reviewing it can be annoying to have to type in your password again so a five second delay uh, doesn't really hurt security much uh, but makes this a lot more usable then you can also set a message that's going uh, to be displayed uh, once the system is uh, locked so uh, you could have a legal disclaimer or uh, something like this uh, set up here we disable automatic login of course so you have to enter a password uh, to log in the second half of the screen here that's where it gets uh, really interesting that's a new feature in os 10.8 mountain lion and it essentially implements a simple whitelist now you do have three different options here essentially it limits what software you're able to install on this system the default here is the medium setting which allows you to install software from the mac app store but you may also download software from other locations as long as the software is signed the signatures have to use a certificate that's authenticated by apple so essentially you're limiting yourself here to apple authorized developers it's not all that hard to become an apple developer all you really have to do is uh, pay a hundred dollars to get uh, one of those uh, certificates if you want to make it a little bit more harsh then you can limit yourself uh, to the app store itself so uh, now you have to download all of your applications from the app store uh, one part where this runs into problems is a uh, flash for example is not in the app store so if you select uh, this then you can no longer apply updates uh, to flash or install flash uh, flash of course is not installed by default on os 10.8 finally you can turn the feature off if you set this to anywhere and uh, then it gives you an additional warning now uh, one little trick here what you can do is you can leave this in the most severe setting however if you need to install something and it shouldn't really be all that often that is not in the app store then you can just uh, go to this uh, setting set it to anywhere install the software that you want to install and then set it back to mac app store this setting is only checked during the install once the software is installed then you can run it no matter what setting you have selected here now while we are here let's also take a quick look at the advanced tab you can set an automatic uh, logout of course uh, that uh, can have issues if you have a uh, software open also if you want the administrator password to access a uh, locked preferences here in your uh, security in your uh, system uh, settings uh, dialogs so that's uh, something uh, good to set the automatic update safe download list now this is a little bit uh, badly named the safe download list is 
Apple's own simple antivirus tool XProtect. With this setting, this list will be updated automatically daily. The list is pretty short. It's about 20 or so signatures. Last time I checked and it's very simple signatures, only looking for very specific Apple targeting malware. Next we have FileVault. FileVault is Apple's uh, disk encryption. This is a very useful feature, of course, in particular for mobile systems. When you enable it, and I just uh, clicked on this here, it will display you this uh, recovery key. Uh, write it down, put it in a safe. If you forget your passwords, this recovery key will give you access to the disk. Essentially, this is the encryption key. And then this encryption key is encrypted itself using your login passwords. So let's proceed here and say continue. You can also store this uh, with Apple. Uh, I don't like to do it. Uh, I keep that myself as I said in a safe. That's usually uh, the best uh, you can do. And uh, then once we click restart, the system will restart and the encryption process will begin. The encryption will happen in the background. So while the encryption is happening, you can still use the system. You can reboot the system. You can shut it down. Of course, the encryption will be a lot faster if you just leave the system idle. So I'm now back logged into the system. Let's open our system preferences again and check on the status of the disk encryption. So security and privacy and then file vault and you see we are about a third or so done and uh, this is not going to bother us any further here just uh, going uh, to continue and uh, let this uh, work itself in the background next let's move on to the firewall settings uh, by default uh, the os 10 firewall is off so the first thing you want to do is uh, turn it on and uh, then let's take a look at the firewall options i find the firewall options to be a little bit uh, confusing here but uh, let's go over uh, the uh, different options we have here first of all we have a checkbox to block all incoming connections. This would block everything that's not uh, essential to keep the operating system running, like for example, DHCP, but it will also block uh, services that you want to share on purpose. Now, secondly, we have uh, then a setting to allow signed software to receive incoming connections. This is uh, similar to uh, the whitelisting, where if the software is properly signed using an Apple approved certificate, then it is able to accept network connections. So if you check this, but do not check block all incoming connections, then you're still limiting incoming connections to software that's actually validly signed. Signed. Finally, you have stealth mode. That means that uh, protocols like ICMP are blocked. So it uh, will be a little bit harder uh, to verify whether the system is online. Let's go ahead and uh, block all incoming connection. As the warning here states, uh, now uh, services that you do enable may no longer work. Once we switch back here to the main firewall screen, we do see a little description of uh, what we just did. I find uh, this is an appropriate configuration for a mobile a PC or laptop that you do connect uh, to wireless networks. We will later talk about additional software that you can install uh, to get a more fine grade control. Now, uh, for an office network, I usually go ahead and uh, do allow sign software because uh, then you may want to enable features like uh, file sharing. In addition to sign software, you also have the option if you click on the plus here to allow specific applications to accept incoming network connections. The other thing that will happen is if you start up an application that does accept incoming connections, you will get a little dialogue pop up that will ask for permission. 
Finally, we do have a privacy tab here. This is uh, where you can enable disable location services. I showed you that earlier when we did the install. So here, if you later decide differently, you can change that. You can also regulate access uh, to contacts. So what applications do ask to access your contacts list and then uh, what to do with uh, diagnostic reports if you would like to send them to Apple or not. So these are the security and uh, privacy settings. Since we already talked about uh, sharing, let's move on to sharing next. With a sharing, you're able to adjust uh, what uh, services are enabled uh, to share data from your system. One other thing you can adjust here is uh, the computer name. I like to have a non-descriptive name. By default, the computer name is uh, the user's, the first uh, user's name. Now we call the first user here administrator. So what I usually like to do here is um, just a nondescript name. This name will be broadcast on the network. So for example, if you are on a wireless network, it is helpful to have a nondescript name so you don't really tell everybody that this is your system. Next, uh, the different services you have here. That's of course, again, a little bit more of a policy issue. One thing you may want to enable is remote login. Remote login enables SSH. So uh, if you enable that, uh, then SSH uh, will work. Now in our case here, we do have the firewall. So even though we enable the service, it will actually not be accessible and you can limit which users are able to connect via SSH. The other sharing services are really more appropriate uh, for internal networks. And unless you specifically need them, like for example, printer sharing, it's of course uh, best uh, to leave them turned off. Now, earlier I talked about the screensaver and uh, how it can be password secured. The other option you have is how long it will take for the screensaver to come on. The default is 20 minutes. Uh, that's a little bit long in my opinion. Uh, I like it more around uh, five minutes and then I rather have it wait a couple seconds as I explained earlier to ask for a password. Uh, so uh, that I think is a little bit of better balance between uh, security and usability, but uh, in, that's also up to you uh, what uh, you find appropriate in your environment. Another small uh, privacy issue here also with uh, indexing of a spotlight. You may exclude certain locations from being indexed. However, the privacy issue here isn't really all that huge. These indexes are kept uh, on your uh, local system. So don't really think there's a big issue in eliminating uh, some of these locations for privacy. It's really more a performance issue. If you have large directories that you don't want to have index, uh, then uh, you may want to add them here. Next, we do have a software update. So uh, let me just uh, click on this. Again, this is locked by default. So you do need to authenticate if you want to change anything here. Default settings are pretty sound. It will check automatically for updates and then download them in the background. On mobile systems, if uh, your laptop is connected a lot uh, to, for example, uh, 3G access points or tethered to a phone, then you do have limited bandwidth allowances you may want uh, to turn off uh, the automatic uh, downloads. And then also uh, by default, uh, the updates are installed automatically. You can uh, check uh, manually whether or not uh, there are any uh, new updates available. And then again, uh, this uh, uses uh, the App Store. Now, one feature that uh, has significantly changed in Mountain Lion is uh, the dictation and uh, speech control. Uh, this uh, now uses uh, the pretty much the same system as uh, Siri on the 
iPhone. First of all, you do have to enable a shortcut here and only if you press that key, then uh, the microphone will actually accept uh, speech uh, control. That's a little bit different from some other systems where there was always the risk of someone walking past your system and uh, giving it uh, speech control commands. The privacy issue uh, with uh, the system is the actual uh, speech recognition does not happen locally. Your speech sample will be sent to Apple, then recognized on Apple's iCloud servers, and then sent back uh, to your system. So. And then of course, a uh, part of security is also uh, backups. And uh, here you have a time machine available. First, uh, you have to select a backup disk. So uh, let me just uh, authenticate. After you authenticate it, you can select a backup disk. I don't have one connection. Uh, connected to the system right now. You could select, for example, a time capsule. One important setting here is you may encrypt the backups. Uh, this is grayed out here because we don't have a disk selected right now. And you do have the option to exclude certain uh, folders uh, from backups. Again, this may be for uh, privacy reasons, but uh, also just you know if these folders are too large or backed up in other ways, uh, you may not want to do it. For example, uh, mail folders that uh, are on your mail server anyway and they can get quite large. So these are the uh, basic security settings uh, for now here. Let's now move on and add some actual users to the system. At this point, we only have an administrator. So let's move ahead and add a normal user to the system. So we're adding a plus here and uh, then just uh, the user's uh, name. We do enter a password. You may also automatically generate a password here by uh, clicking on this uh, key. So this will give us a suggested password. You can also uh, set uh, different uh, password uh, policies here. We do have four different account types. The administrator, of course, we already set up and you may have multiple administrators. Standard is uh, the default uh, user account. Manage with parental controls is a standard user, but also allows you to limit access uh, to the internet and such uh, using parental controls. Sharing only users cannot log in locally. However, they can log in to shared drives, uh, shared resources on your system. So uh, this uh, may be appropriate uh, for a system that's used as a server to share files. Now let's look at the guest account in a little bit uh, more uh, detail. I actually don't like the default setting. The default setting does not allow the guest to log into the computer directly, but it does allow remote connections to shared folders. Of course, uh, in addition to allowing it uh, here, you also have to set up uh, shared folders with a uh, guest access. So at the very first, I would uh, uncheck this. This way, anybody connecting remotely to a shared folder has to authenticate. You may argue that it's a good idea to allow guests to log into this computer. One reason I have seen that's being quoted as allowing this is if you do have uh, via iCloud the Find My Mac system set up and your hard disk is encrypted, then someone stealing your computer actually can't fully boot it up because they have to decrypt the hard drive. If you do allow guests to log into your computer, then if the computer is rebooted, the guest can log in to a very limited account that does not have access to the hard disk. So uh, this way you'll still be able to locate the computer if the guest logs in, but your hard disk is still protected using disk encryption. As it is stated here, once the guest logs out, all files are deleted. So you do get a little bit of separation between users. Now, in addition to the settings for individual accounts, we also have uh, global login options here. 
One thing to consider is whether or not to actually offer a list of users as the system is booted up or whether to ask for a name and a password. So uh, this would make it uh, harder for a stranger to log in because if I select your name and password, then they also have to guess the username, not just the password. I'll leave this here at list of users for now because I want to show you later how to log in as a guest. Then whether or not to show the sleep, restart and shutdown buttons uh, before the user logs in. Policy issue, I think, uh, no real uh, strict uh, security issue here. Depends again on uh, how afraid you are of someone shutting down a system that's unintended, that's not supposed to be uh, shut down. Then you can also turn off uh, password hints uh, globally. So uh, let me do uh, this. Uh, that uh, will take care if a user against a policy sets up a uh, password hint. Now uh, the uh, fast user switching menu, uh, you'll have this up here in the right hand corner. It allows you to switch uh, between users without logging out uh, the original user. If you do have a central network uh, authentication server, then you can join it here. This is uh, really built around uh, OS X server, but it can also be used uh, together with uh, Active Directory, for example. This is a really important tool if you would like uh, your uh, Mac systems to join an Active Directory domain in order to manage uh, policies and uh, users. And a little bit hidden here, we have a feature to set a master password. This master password uh, can be used by an administrator to reset any user's password. So uh, this is kind of a little escrow scheme here. If a user forgets their password or refuses to actually uh, give up their password in case, uh, for example, they're terminated, the master password uh, can then be used to reset this user's password. Now I went ahead and rebooted the system to show you what the login screen looks like now. We do have the administrator user and the guest user account. Let me log in as a guest user to show you how this works. I will have to restart the system here and it will reboot now into a very basic setup that only allows me access to Safari. So as I start up here, Safari comes up with a little uh, login information uh, page here. And uh, now I can go uh, to whatever uh, page I would like. Of course, I'm still limited uh, by the parental controls for the guest account, but uh, there is uh, nothing else here to do. So a uh, user could probably still run some Safari exploit or so to break out of this but uh, this is really meant uh, sort of as a kiosk setup. I can change my startup disk, so I could boot from a USB drive or something like this, but again, I would not have access uh, to the encrypted drive. Then in order to log out, you either have to restart or shut down the system, and then of course you end up at the login screen again. Now let me log in as a normal user to show you some of the limitations that uh, come with uh, using a non-administrator account uh, for the normal user. So I'm logged in as a normal user. Now, one of the restrictions of running as a normal user, not as an administrator, is that you do not have access to sudo. So if I'm trying a sudo and then enter my uh, password here for this normal user, I'm getting this warning that I'm not in the sudoers file. So in order to do something as an administrator, I would have to log in as an administrator, for example, using the fast user switching or on the command line, I can then again log into uh, the administrator account. And once I'm an administrator, uh, now I can run a sudo. So one problem here is that uh, if you set it up like this, you have multiple users on the system, one administrator user, if any of these users has to issue an administrator action, they would log in as administrator, which of course uh, would uh, reduce the traceability of uh, what's happening here. If a user 
has legitimate need uh, to actually run administrator uh, commands, it's probably best to make them an administrator or set up a specific administrator account for them versus a generic administrator account. So since we are logged in as a normal user here, let me go over some of the privacy and security settings in Safari. You will find the settings here in preferences. And uh, first of all, not really security related, uh, but uh, since we got it here, you use Safari to select your default web browser. So uh, if you have uh, Chrome or Firefox installed, you first have to start up Safari and then select uh, Firefox or Chrome as your default uh, web browser if you would like to do so. Then you can set the expiration time for your history. So if you are more concerned about uh, privacy, you probably would like to delete them after a day or a week. Sadly, there is no setting to delete them after Safari closes. Similar for the download list, uh, when Safari quits, uh, this will clear out the list of uh, downloaded files whenever Safari closes. The files themselves, of course, will not uh, be deleted. A very important setting that you, in my opinion, should uncheck is open save files after downloading. If this is checked and that's a default, then for example, PDFs are automatically opened as soon as you download them. So there is no user interaction. And if there is a suspicious PDF, then of course that would be opened without you being able to do anything about it. This has been abused in the past uh, with uh, disk image files that also were mounted automatically and then exploits uh, were launched against, uh, for example, file drivers. Next, we have the autofill setting. I would recommend that you uncheck these. Now, the one I sometimes keep checked is usernames and passwords. I am a big fan of uh, password safe software, so I can actually have uh, different usernames and passwords on all sites, but typically I use a third party product here. So in this case, I may still uncheck it. The problem with uh, pre-filling some of these forms is that with JavaScript uh, tricks, it may happen that a form is automatically submitted after it is pre-filled and that can be used to steal some of your contact information. If you do allow passwords to be saved, then this passwords list gives you a list of all websites and usernames and passwords that are saved, so you could edit them after the fact and remove them. The security setting here allows you to enable and disable plugins. I highly recommend to disable Java. With JavaScript, you're pretty much stuck. There isn't really much you can do without JavaScript, so you kind of have to enable this. The fraudulent site setting will use the standard Google blacklist. So what happens if you have this enabled that Safari will check with Google as you visit a website whether or not it is marked as malicious. The privacy setting allows you to regulate cookies. The Default settings here I think are reasonable. It does not allow third-party cookies, but other than that, uh, cookies are allowed. Then if a website has access to location services, here it asks once a day whether or not a particular website that asks for location service access should have access. The website tracking checkbox enables the do not track header. Of course, it's up to the website to actually obey this header, but I do recommend that you set this. From time to time, you may want to remove all website data. This will uh, remove data that websites stored on the site on your browser, for example, via cookies or HTML5 storage. And these are the important uh, settings when it comes uh, to Safari. Notifications uh, limits uh, whether or not websites have access to the notification center to send you pop-up notifications. And then of course, from time to time, you may also want to review the extensions, whether or not there is anything unexpected here. So this covers uh, the basic security configuration for OS X Mountain Lion and Safari. Now, one area where I think uh, OS X is really not all that great is the 
firewall configuration, it only limits inbound connection, and even that's uh, not a terribly uh, fine grained. So uh, this is something where I do recommend a third party product. And uh, the product uh, I like here is called a uh, little snitch. Little snitch uh, will pop up a warning whenever some software tries to establish a network connection and then ask you to approve it. And what you see here is a little snapshot of uh, different rules that little snitch learned over time on my system. This of course is a little bit annoying at first when you start it up, uh, but uh, after a day or two it becomes uh, pretty quiet and uh, very usable. In addition, you also get a little uh, network uh, monitor that uh, will uh, show you all the network connections uh, currently uh, going on from your system. So again, uh, that's a very easy to use tool to keep a little eye on what's happening on your system. In addition to installing a firewall like Little Snitch, you may also want to consider an antivirus tool. Now, uh, OS X comes with X-Protect. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but like I said, it's quite uh, limited. Uh, I have Sophos installed on uh, this system. Now, Sophos is free for home use. If you do want to use it uh, for a business computer, you do have to pay for it. Works quite well for me. Other options are Kaspersky has a reasonably priced antivirus product uh, for OS X. Hasn't worked quite as well uh, for me as uh, Sophos, uh, but it uh, tries to do a little bit more. It tries to also monitor network connections and uh, that part uh, doesn't seem to work quite as well as promised and uh, is causing problems for me. Symantec, I believe, uh, also has an antivirus product for OS X. These products, of course, will also detect uh, Windows uh, viruses and that can be helpful if you're in a mixed operating system environment and uh, you don't want to spread uh, Windows malware to your Windows hosts. Well, this is it for now. Uh, certainly a lot more to talk about when it comes to OS X and security. And uh, maybe we'll have a follow up with uh, some of the more advanced topics and uh, some of the feedback I'm sure we are going to get uh, based on this uh, video. Thanks again for listening and uh, talk to you next month for the next monthly thread update or maybe tomorrow for uh, the daily Stormcast, our daily news summary podcast.